Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the Japan Society for the gracious invitation uh, and to fly me here from the West Coast. Uh, I always love visiting New York because my daughter lives in Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> so, unfortunately, she's on the West Coast right now in Seattle. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, hopefully this will be, you know, not necessarily new news for many of you. Uh, if you're here in the audience, you probably have a strong interest in Japanese cuisine and miso. And so you probably know more about this than I may. Uh, but hopefully I can shed a little bit of a different perspective on some of this. Uh, so uh, let's see. Here's the, let's see how, if this works. And, um, and let's, let, okay. Uh, so let, let me start by first saying uh, <laughs> that whatever I say does not represent the views of Kaiser Permanente, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, or UC Davis, where I happen to have a, a faculty appointment, um, or any other organization I'm affiliated with, including the Japan Society for this evening. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. I've started doing this once I joined Kaiser Permanente. They seem to be a lot more of a stickler than in my previous positions at Columbia University or at the University of Minnesota. So anyway, okay. Uh, so miso. Uh, you're going to experience what miso is. You're going to have a great demonstration uh, later on, and there's going to be a, a reception afterwards, so you'll get to taste you know, miso in many different forms. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, sort of give a brief highlight. Uh, basically, as everybody knows, it's uh, primarily, as we know it, uh, made from soybeans and salt, and perhaps some grain uh, is added in. And basically, you mash them all together, and then you let them sit and ferment for a long time. That's basically what it's about. Uh, and depending on the type of grain and how long you age, age it, uh, uh, the, the type of miso that's created can vary. So you can have different you know, color types of miso. So I'm not certain exactly which ones these are. Uh, these, a friend of mine, John Bellamy, who uh, started the Miso Master Company, uh, gave me this slide. Uh, but he didn't tell me exactly, you know, which misos these are. But this one looks like hacho miso, which might be just the soybeans. This one looks like it might be a mugi miso, the one, the lighter brown color, uh, which is with barley. And the one up here looks like maybe it's a, you know, a more, more mellow, shorter, shorter term fermentation miso. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, that gives you an idea of, you know, the type of variety. And when you go to a typical Japanese no, grocery store or whatever, you will see something like this, you know, in the, to purchase your miso. Uh, and many of these are from uh, our products from Marukome. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so let's step back a little bit and take a look at Japan, okay? Here's life expectancy as of 2004. And these are, uh, I pulled off the top, you know, 20 plus countries around the world. And sitting way over here with the longest life expectancy is Japan, okay? <clears throat> and here's the U.S. here, you know, uh, okay? <laughs> we're, you know, maybe not doing so well in the world scheme of things. Obviously, we're doing a lot better than some other places. But uh, uh, so, you know, people look at what's going on around the world uh, and comparisons of these uh, places. And one of the things that people point to uh, as possibly helping to contribute to these differences in life expectancy and health in general, which is what I'll be talking about, uh, are dietary patterns. And you can see that, particularly if you look at 1961 Japan and the USA, which isn't too different from the way it was back in 1961, uh, you can see that, for example, people in Japan eat a lot more rice, we eat more wheat, uh, we eat a lot more of sugar and sweeteners, a lot more red meat, uh, and a lot more dairy food. In Japan, they eat more fish, and here's soybeans, of which miso, of course, is one of the products. Basically, we don't, in the U.S. context, soy, soy foods don't really register. I mean, it is hidden in a lot of foods, but basically it doesn't register as, uh, as we're eating very much on a per capita basis. Uh, and here's seaweed as well, which doesn't really register. And so you can see, you know, back in 1961, this, it was a very different pattern. Japan, you know, more contemporary, has moved in the U.S. direction. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, 
sort of stepping back a little bit too, this, this is a picture of the US Food Guide Pyramid, which is no longer used by the USDA, but was the basis for dietary guidance for where we should be going uh, in the United States generally. Uh, and uh, it's the basis for, it was the basis for food recommendations. <clears throat> back when this came out in the early 1990s, uh, there, me and a number of other, a number of my colleagues, uh, came up with an alternative, uh, which uh, one version was a traditional healthy Mediterranean diet pyramid, uh, and we also came up with a traditional healthy Asian diet pyramid. <clears throat> so basically, if you look at this uh, slide uh, or this graphic, some of the things we didn't like was sort of lumping all meat, poultry, fish, dry beans, eggs, and nuts all into one group. Okay? it doesn't really make sense to put them all together. Because some of those things you actually shouldn't eat very much of, and some you actually could eat on a regular basis, like soy foods, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so those, those are some of the things that we uh, thought would be better. And so what we did was you know, we pulled some of those things out. We said, okay, on a daily basis, you actually should be eating some of these types of foods. Red meat, actually, you shouldn't be eating much at all, based on what we know both from a traditional, you know, looking at traditional Japanese and East Asian and also Indian cuisine, you know, red meat really was not consumed very much at all. I mean, it's, it certainly wasn't avoided. It was certainly part of, you know, what the uh, cultures enjoyed, but it wasn't sort of had to be the center of your plate. Uh, <clears throat> whereas some of these foods were, you know, available on a regular basis. So that's certainly one of the things that uh, we... Uh, wanted to emphasize that there's actually uh, different choices that should be emphasized that the traditional food guide pyramid does not, uh, or the USDA food guide pyramid does not do. Uh, so just again, to, just to say, you know, they're not using that anymore, they're using this thing, uh, the Choose My Plate, so you can go to choosemyplate.gov and, you know, sort of learn, you know, more about the way they're now doing dietary guidance. But one of the funny things about this, you know, and they do the same thing, is if you look at these basically five food groups, four of them are actually foods, and one of them is not, okay? It's actually a nutrient, okay, protein. And like I said, you know, it actually makes a difference in terms of what you consume. So I'm gonna digress very briefly and take a look at uh, sort, of, sort of disease rates. Uh, looking at colon cancer specifically, okay? This is India. Uh, colon cancer rates dating back from, the late, from 1960 or thereabouts to about 10 years ago, uh, which is when the most recent, uh, recent available international rates are, have been published by the World Health Organization. Uh, among the lowest in the world, this is the Connecticut, uh, which has, the U.S. has among the highest rates in the world. Okay, so let's take a look at Japan, where, as I showed you on that previous slide, dietary patterns and food intake have been changing. Okay dramatic changes, you know, in a really short time, uh, disease rates are really changing in Japan. It used to be among the lowest rates, like India in the world, now is comparable to the United States. Uh, this is the same thing for, uh, for women, the previous slide was men, uh, and you can see the same pattern. You know, so really, what's going on, this dramatic change, there are changes happening in Japanese cuisine in Japan, you know, things like you know, when did McDonald's start? Not, not to blame McDonald's. Mac, you know, McDonald's does great things. I was just reading the, about the fact that they're opening up a couple of their first all-vegetarian restaurants in India. So, uh, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> and just to look at, you know, meat, fish, milk, and eggs as examples, uh, here are the same three countries, and you can see, you know, India has continued to have very low consumption of these foods. Uh, the U.S. has continued to have relatively high consumption, and you can see Japan is right in the middle. Uh, uh, dramatically increasing, you know, paralleling those colon cancer changes. So here's cardiovascular diseases, uh, and you can see, uh, again, this is 2004, but uh, the overall rates are substantially higher in the United States, and heart attacks, ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarctions, heart attacks are substantially higher. Uh, and so this is also something that, you know, characterizes, you know, in Japan, they've traditionally had really low heart disease rates. Uh, <clears throat> they are going up some, but they have traditionally had that, and we still see this difference. And it's probably attributable in part to some of these foods. Okay, so what about miso and soy? Okay. 
here's another picture of you know miso sitting on a grocery shelf. <laughs> So one of the first studies that looked specifically at miso and disease, chronic disease rates was this study that was published by uh, Dr. Hirayama uh, from an ongoing prospective study of about 250,000 people in Japan <clears throat> and looking specifically at stomach cancer rates. And so this is the frequency of miso soup consumption. And here's people who drank miso soup or ate miso soup on a daily basis versus basically reported not. Uh, uh, taking miso soup, and you can see that the less frequent users, as you consume less, the stomach cancer rates increased for both men and women. You know, rates are higher in men for other reasons. Uh, <clears throat> and this was one of the first, you know, st studies of this type, epidemiologic studies, that suggested, hey, you know, maybe you know, choosing miso makes a difference. <clears throat> And of course, there are many other things that you know, go along with uh, you know, people who may consume miso soup on a daily basis. But in any case, it, there was a clear association here. And so this is, uh, I borrowed this slide from uh, Dr. Lisa Bandera, who's a colleague of mine who I invited to come tonight. Uh, she's uh, at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. But one of the things about soy foods that has attracted a lot of in interest is um, uh, it contains a number of different compounds, chemoactive compounds, uh, one of which are isoflavones. And these are some of the various things that isoflavones have been demonstrated to do in one context or another. And I'm not going to go over this in any sort of detail, but basically what this means is that in a cancer context, and actually also in a cardiovascular disease context, soy foods probably have beneficial properties. So that's sort of the bottom line. <laughs> okay. Now, back when I was at the University of Minnesota, I was involved in this study called the Iowa Women's Health Study, a study where we've been following 40,000 women since the mid-1980s. And so we uh, wanted to do, take a look at, hey, is soy intake, which we really only had asked one question about tofu consumption, uh, is that related to breast cancer risk? Okay. And so when we looked at this, you can see that the breast cancer risk, after adjusting for other breast cancer risk factors, was lower among those who reported any tofu intake compared with none. Okay. However, this was not anywhere near what we call statistically significant in our world. Uh, and that's because in Iowa, hardly anybody eats tofu. Okay. Less than 3% of the 40,000 women reported eating any tofu. Okay. So, so it's not, you know, something, it's not like, you know, being in Greenwich Village, you know, or Berkeley, you know, California or something. Okay. Uh, and, and so it's, um, and one of the ironies of this is that the state of Iowa, where all these women were living, is one of the major soy producing states in, in the US, and actually one of the major soy producing states, you know, or air regions in the world. Uh, so where does all that soy go? Well, some of it goes to Japan, you know, and it's made into the miso that you're going to taste later. <laughs> But most of it goes to feed the livestock. Okay. And so I was also one of the major pork producing states in the, in the US. And, uh, uh, and so that's really where most of the soybeans go that's grown in the United States. Relatively little goes to human consumption. <clears throat> uh, so, so we can't study this question in Iowa because nobody eats soy foods in Iowa. But we can study this question in Asia where people actually eat soy foods. And so this is a study uh, that I was involved in uh, as a, a consultant and a co-investigator initially, a study of uh, breast cancer and soy intake in Shanghai. And so what we did was we enrolled 1,500 women with breast cancer and 1,500 women without, and then we asked them about what they ate uh, prior to becoming, uh, getting breast cancer. And so what the analysis suggested was that those who overall ate more soy foods had a somewhat lower likelihood of having breast cancer. Uh, is one way of interpreting this. And this is split out by whether the breast cancer occurred premenopausally or postmenopausally. Um, now, one of the interesting things we also did was we asked the women uh, what they ate, how much soy they ate when they were in adolescence. And actually, the relationship was more striking when we looked at earlier life intake. Uh, and so that's actually 
these findings and similar findings, which I guess I'll skip over. Uh, these are Asian Americans, basically the same sort of picture. Another study in Shanghai, the same sort of picture. I'll just skip over that. Basically suggesting that what you eat earlier in life can potentially make a difference you know, later in life as far as breast cancer risk goes. And that those who have you know, higher soy intake at both time periods tend to have the lowest risk. That's basically what this slide shows. The lowest risk are those who had high adult soy protein intake and high adolescent soy intake. Uh, and the highest risk, the reference group, was in those who were low in both groups. <clears throat> uh, so, so here, you know, where people actually do eat soy, you know, and there's variation in how much you can actually pick up these types of differences. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, if you pick up these, uh, I think it's miso master, I'm not absolutely certain, and you open up the lid you know, on these plastic tubs, uh, and then there's a little insert it's, uh, that says, hey, miso has been demonstrated to decrease the risk of breast cancer. And then it gives a journal of the National Cancer Institute reference. So that's actually this, this paper. <laughs> okay. uh, and so here's miso in the green. I probably should have made it more brown colored. Uh, anyway, soy foods in general. And then isoflavones, which are the, one of the chemicals that are found in soy, particularly rich in soy foods. And so these are people consuming the highest amount. The soy was just split into three groups, but the miso and isoflavones were split into four. Uh, <clears throat> and the highest consumption groups uh, had the lowest breast cancer risk, and these were statistically significant, uh, which is interesting, both for miso and for sort of isoflavones as a marker of soy intake. Uh, so uh, anyway, there's some, interest, some interesting findings there. And here's soy intake in general. So this thing is called a forest plot. Uh, so this, this is the relative risk for any individual study. So here's the Yamamoto study I just showed. Um, <clears throat> and here's the relative risk of 0.46 for high soy intake versus, versus uh, low. Uh, this line would be 1.0, meaning there's no difference in the high intake versus the low intake. And so anything on this, si this side, uh, the left-hand side, where the black boxes are, would mean that that study shows a protective relationship, an inverse relationship, more soy, less breast cancer. And anything on this side, meaning this one, would basically shows the opposite and this one doesn't show any relationship. But overall, when you pull them all, that's this thing down here. Uh, <clears throat> and when you pull them all, the summary of the relative risk you know, across all these studies is uh, 0.71, about a, almost a 30% decreased likelihood of developing breast cancer from higher soy food intake. These are in studies in Asian populations. Here's studies in Western populations where actually you don't see anything, and the summary of relative risk is basically close to nothing. But again, if you remember, most of these studies uh, in Western populations are kind of like studying p women in Iowa, where there's not a lot of variation and not a lot of eating of soy foods. So very lo relatively low intakes, whereas the Asian populations, there's more variation and wider, higher intakes, so there's greater ability to actually see these relationships. So uh, here's another uh, summary. Uh, here's MISO uh, across uh, about eight studies, I think it was, uh, six studies for MISO, eight here, including the uh, studies not just in English. And about a 10% reduced risk. These are, this is borderline statistically significant, so to speak. Soy foods in general uh, seem to be associated with a decreased risk of breast cancer and tofu as well. Uh, so, uh, so it looks like soy foods in general uh, do appear to have some sort of beneficial association with uh, breast cancer risk. Here's soy intake and other diseases, just to highlight a few other things from uh, the Shanghai Women's Health Study, which has been following 75,000 women in Shanghai. Uh, and you can see heart disease death, uh, suggestion of a decreased risk, non-fatal heart attacks, dramatic decrease, total heart disease, dramatic decrease. There's type 2 diabetes, a decrease, bone fractures, a decrease. Uh, so it looks like you know, soy foods either themselves because of things like isoflavones or as a marker of a more healthful dietary pattern, uh, as we saw back in the early 60s in Japan, uh, uh, appears to be associated with decreased likelihood of developing these major chronic diseases. Uh, okay, miso, you know, is great food. If you probably all tasted it, had miso up. It's salty, okay? <laughs> So, uh, so what about the salt? Okay, here's, here's Miso Master just as an example. 
Okay, Americans consume unhealthy amounts of sodium in their food, far exceeding public health recommendations. Conser consuming too much is a big problem. This is what the Institute of Medicine said. Uh, uh, certainly increases the risk for high blood pressure and its uh, concomitant conditions. Okay, so miso is salty, okay. right? You've probably tasted it. So, so maybe we shouldn't be eating so much. Uh, and just looking at uh, sodium intake estimates, here's China and Japan, you know, among the highest intake of salt, basically, ac across the world. Here's the US here, uh, sort of middling in these studies. Um, uh, but definitely, you know, high sodium intake. And it's not just the miso in Japanese cuisine. It's a number of other, you know, high salt uh, pickled products and other things like that. This is that same cardiovascular disease slide I showed. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at this in a little more detail, which I didn't mention before, Stroke rates, cerebrovascular disease, stroke rates are higher in Japan than here. Uh, and it's thought that one of the reasons is higher blood pressure and higher sodium intake. Okay, so, so it is something that we need to be concerned about. Okay, so can miso mitigate the hypertension effect of sodium? Okay, we know salt increases blood pressure. Uh, so I rarely talk about Animal studies, all the studies I do are in humans, but here's a rat study, okay, in rats that are bred to develop uh, uh, high blood pressure when they're given salt, okay? And this was just re recently published. And here they took these rats and split them into four groups, a control which basically got water as the main sort of liquid uh, with no added sodium, and then water with 0.9% uh, sodium solution, uh, higher sodium solution, 1.3%, and then miso soup containing the same amount of sodium as uh, the 1.3%. So these four groups, and you can see this is the cumulative salt loading, which basically means how much sodium the rats are getting exposed to. And you can see that the miso soup group is actually getting exposed to higher amounts of sodium okay, uh, <clears throat> over the course of the study. Okay, but here's the systolic blood pressure okay, in, by the diet groups in these rats. And you can see the control is the lowest. Uh, wherever my light went. Anyway, the lowest one. Uh, the highest is the 1.3% sodium group, and the miso containing, the miso soup group is actually lower and comparable to the 0.9% sodium group. So it seems like, you know, even though the sodium content and the amount that the rats are being exposed to is actually on the high end, you know, and comparable to the 1.3%, their blood pressure change is actually lower uh, and more to the in between sodium group. So here are some slides which I'll just quickly show, which is glomerular sclerosis, damage to the kidneys, basically, uh, <clears throat> in these rats. And this is the control. And so uh, <clears throat> most of them didn't have any damage to kidneys, and a few had a little bit of damage. And so I'll just quickly go through this. Here's the 0.9% sodium group. You can see those bars shifted a bit more. You know, a much smaller proportion didn't have uh, damage and, you know, substantial had 25%. Here's the 1.3% sodium. All of them had some damage to their kidneys. And then here's the miso group. They sort of shifted back to the pattern that the 0.9% sodium group, even though they had higher sodium intake. And so they suggested, hey, maybe, you know, miso helps to mitigate some of this bad sodium effect. Now, this is not like the control, so there's clearly still some hypertension-associated damage, but maybe it's a little, you know, it's not as bad as, you know, taking salt just as it is. Uh, and so here's uh, another study of uh, cardiovascular disease by some colleagues of mine at the National Cancer Center in Japan, uh, but looking at cardiovascular disease. And here's stroke, uh, heart attacks, and uh, both of them combined. And what you can see is there's actually, you know, there's miso in soup intake. Uh, these are the highest intake. Doesn't look like there's much of an impact. And if, if you would think that uh, the high sodium content of miso soup would be increasing blood pressure rates and then increasing stroke rates as a result, then maybe you'd expect this last group to have higher, you know, stroke rates, uh, you know, or that they would go up with increasing miso soup intake. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and here's a, uh, that was in men, this is in women, the same sort of picture. Uh, if anything, it's sort of somewhat lower rates with regular uh, miso soup consumption. Uh, so, you know, 
maybe, you know, if you're going to eat salty stuff, you know, maybe taking it through miso is a little better than, you know, through some other vehicles, okay? It's, again, you know, you, it's not something that you want to go overboard with, but, you know, it looks like it maybe is better. So here's miso. So anyway, to summarize, miso is a traditional soy food. Miso and, others, and other aspects of diet, I should stress, you know, these studies don't in and of themselves say, aha, miso is definitely the beneficial thing, but certainly points to it being part of this healthy dietary pattern and probably plays an important role in the prevention of Western diseases. Um, miso is now widely available, and it's not just a soy food. Uh, this is from uh, Miso Master, his chickpea miso. So instead of using soybeans, using chickpeas or garbanzo, garbanzo beans as the main you know, legume, that's uh, part of uh, what's uh, made there. Uh, and of course, you know, here are some more products, but most people know about miso soup. There are a lot of other ways of using miso. Here's just some, some one example, and Marukome you know, has some other examples. You know, here's a whole line of uh, uh, salad dressings that all have miso flavoring in them. So, just as an example, so uh, so there, are, miso is infiltrating its way into you know other aspects of American cuisine, which we'll have a demonstration from, in a moment. And thank you. Uh, that's my email address. If you, you know, people always say, "Why are you showing your email address? You don't want to get bombarded with emails." But anyway, there it is. Uh, <laughs> so, and, this, by the way, is my daughter who lives in Williamsburg, and, and of course we should go to you know, the restaurant Bite, which you're going to hear a little bit more about, but she happens to be in an off-Broadway show called Fuerza Bruta, which is happening down in Union Square, and that's a photo from that show. <laughs> okay. So we'll do a Q&A later um, uh, after we have a nice demonstration, and meanwhile I'm going to uh, introduce our... Uh, chef demonstrator. I'm pulling out my little handy uh, sort of crib sheet here. Sorry. Uh, we've had a great time, you know, sort of talking, you know, as everyone was assembling for this, but uh, I'll just read a little bit here. And apologies for reading. Uh, so, uh, Chef Edwin Blanco, I know he's also in your program. Um, he's going to do a demonstration of use of miso, and, and, uh, and I, I'm as excited as you are to see what he's going to be doing. And as uh, mentioned at the beginning of the program, he is the owner of Vite Restaurant, and he's also worked with uh, Chef David Boulet uh, at uh, Boulet, at the restaurant Boulet, also with Thomas Keller at the French Laundry in Napa Valley. And he's known for his simple, clean flavors and love of using fresh and local ingredients, uh, so just like a Californian. And uh, he'll demonstrate some new and innovative uses of miso. So, you know, I was asked to do this and um, come up with uh, different uses for miso. And the truth is, I, I use miso in the restaurant. Um, I think it's a great way, uh, kind of speaking off of, of that lecture there. Um, you know, it's, when you're using miso, you're not really using salt in addition to miso. And miso does provide such a well-rounded flavor. Uh, salt's the only thing that's going to make anything tastes like it should. It's the only thing that's going to make salmon taste like salmon or scallop taste like a better scallop. Uh, but miso does that, but also has more of a well-rounded flavor behind that. So you're less likely to have to put more salt into it. Um, so basically what I decided to do, to, to do today was uh, a miso marinated salmon uh, or miso glazed salmon with uh, uh, some bok choy. And, uh, and you know, miso so healthy, I decided to pair it with butter because it's so unhealthy. It's just, it's that healthy that you can do that. Um, so basically what I do is uh, we make a little miso butter here. And uh, obviously you don't have to use all this butter. Um, and it's almost equal parts of miso and butter. And really you're just going to mix that around in a bowl. And you want to make sure your butter, uh, you leave it out and make sure it's nice and soft. And so in the meantime, um, we're just going to add a little soy oil to the pan. Um, you're really just, uh, for the vegetables, this is going to be, you're basically just trying to glaze the vegetables up here. So um, I start out with a little shallot, and it kind of just is a, a base flavor, and uh, you can work with that here. And then, um, so we're just sweating these out so they're translucent. We're not really trying to get any color on this or anything like that. Uh, I also add a little ginger. We do that right away with the shallot so that um, 
you know, you don't want like a crunchy ginger in it really. So we're just sweating that out a little bit. Um, and then we're going to add a little bit of garlic. So this is kind of a little bit of a holy trinity at the restaurant, I think. It's, um, you know, it, it just really provides that fresh flavor, um, but also the base of the garlic and the uh, shallot. So we're just going to saute this up a little bit. And then uh, we go in with our, uh, these are Fresno peppers. Um, and, and I already, uh, for the sake of the demonstration, I, uh, I already blanched bok choy in water and uh, shocked it uh, to keep that nice color. You can certainly go right into the pan with the bok choy raw. Um, and it depends on your taste. If you like really crunchy vegetables, I would do that. Uh, I, like, um, I like it cooked a little bit more. This, this is still a little al dente, but uh, it's, not, it's not as crunchy as just going in raw. So basically, this is it. We, we're doing a little uh, medley of vegetables. Um, so then I start with uh, a little bit of, uh, I have a little bit of mirin here. Um, and mirin is basically, actually, I'm doing sake here. Uh, so just adding that little alcohol there. And really, we're trying to just glaze the vegetables a little bit for that flavor. You're not trying to have them sitting in a lot of sauce and really saucy. You just want to glaze the vegetables. So a um, little sake, then a little, little bit of water. Or you can use veg stock. You can use chicken stock. Um, and, you know, for those of you who are having aversion to butter or you think it's very unhealthy, honestly, you can forego the butter altogether and you can go straight in with the miso. You don't really need to use the butter. I like to balance salt and fat and vinegar and, you know, all those acids. So, you know, I think it, the butter kind of rounds out the miso and takes away that saltiness. But you certainly, if you're, if you're not, uh, like I said, if you have an aversion to butter. So this would be, you know, you want to mix this till it's pretty homogenous. Um, so just go right in there with that. Don't worry, I wash my hands. Uh, so, like I said, we're just going to glaze these vegetables. Go with a little bit more water. So, that's basically what we're doing with that. Um, so I'm going to set that down. We're going to start on the salmon. So basically, we're going to start on the marinade for the salmon. And I would suggest leaving, and, and this marinade, by the way, can be used for a lot of different applications. I almost did uh, prawns tonight, um, but just for the sake of, of logistics, I, I decided to go salmon. But, um, so this application will work with prawns or uh, cod or, um, you know, I would say a lot of halibut you can, you can marinate. Um, so we're going to go in the bowl with a little bit of uh, our miso paste. This is red miso paste. We're going to go in with a little bit of mirin, which mirin is just, um, it's like sake. It, the alcohol content varies. This happens to have like 1% of alcohol, but it's, it's always less alcohol than sake. But uh, um, so that's it. So a little sesame oil. Then we're going to whisk this together. You're just basically going to form a glaze here. And then uh, I just pour this over the salmon. So again, this is really going to impart a lot of flavor. And you know, if you want just kind of a lighter flavor on it, do it for a couple hours. If you want to really get it flavor kind of all the way through, I would suggest, I would definitely go 24 hours on this. And the salmon you're going to have today is uh, 24 hours as well. So I just mix this up a little bit um, and just make sure, you know, it's touching uh, all the surface area that you can. Um, so again, I am going in a pan for the sake of uh, the demonstration, but really um, I would suggest going, taking this right into a broiler and uh, it kind of goes away, it takes that fat content away for anybody who's, who's kind of uh, reluctant to use oil. Uh, but for the sake of the demonstration, we're just going to go right into a pan here. And I'm not going to take it all the way because I don't want to smoke out the place. We don't, have a, we don't have a hood system here, so I don't want anybody out on the street with the fire department coming in. 
Um, so basically, you're just getting your pan uh, to, to that point where you have that white, kind of that white puff of smoke. Uh, I, I cook all my fish that way. It's kind of the starting point. You know, um, you know the pan's ready when you just see that little hint of white smoke, uh, and it won't stick. So I'm going to put this in here. Um, I do have a finished product as well, um, but we'll start it up here. I don't have the smoke yet. So meanwhile, I'm just going to kind of plate the dish and, and let you see that. I did the, a little bit of the sauce, a little bit of the glaze um, outside of the, or outside of the uh, lecture hall here. So we'll just plate this dish a little bit. Um, at the restaurant, we actually serve this with a, a miso broth. And it's not a soup. I actually make a dashi broth. Uh, use a little bit of kombu, uh, make a broth out of that, and then we, we uh, add some red miso paste. And uh, there we go, thanks, Clara. So we're just trying to, it's going to actually get um, very dark. The sugar, there's a little, I actually forgot the sugar, but in the marinade I put a little bit of sugar. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so we, we uh, add the sugar. It, it actually will get a little caramelized in the pan. But that's really flavorful, actually, and it tastes really good. You don't, obviously don't want to burn it, but you do want to have it get pretty dark. Um, so, like I said, at the restaurant, we serve this in a bowl. Um, but here, with the ginger and the garlic, this really, these vegetables just really have a lot of flavor. It's very simple. Um, and then what I did was uh, I just did a little glazed piece off at the restaurant, just so you can see. Um, so, it, you know, like I said, it has this kind of dark uh, color to it, but it's actually a really fl flavorful, um, it has a lot of flavor to it. Um, so basically, that's it for the, for the dish. Uh, that's it, guys. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we're doing a little Q&A now. Um, well, the short answer to that question is uh, the, the event was about miso, but um, so <laughs> that made my decision very easy. Uh, <laughs> but using it in the restaurant, I think, you know, there's only uh, certain things that, like I said, for me, miso kind of provides that well-rounded flavor that you don't get, uh, I believe the Japanese term is umami. It's, it's kind of that other sense of, of taste. You know, there's salt, there's vinegar, there's, you know, uh, acid, those kinds of taste, but to me, it, it, it's that kind of uh, hidden flavor that you, um, you know when it's not, you know when it's there, and maybe you don't realize when, when it's not there, but when you taste it, you, you know, it's, and it doesn't have to be in such a, you know, like miso soup, certainly that's what you're tasting is a miso, but kind of as a background in other dishes, it does provide that well-roundedness that I find nothing else does provide. Well, I guess with, as a home cook, I was mm -hmm. noticing Sure. And there are other dishes that I sometimes use miso. But I've never done a side by side. I mean, you could use it any of those. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I've I mean, never done a side by side yeah. comparison, so I just hope maybe you could give us. No, I mean, I think, you know, soy sauce does give you that salt content, but I think, again, I don't think it gives you that well rounded, uh, which I love soy sauce as well. And actually, the dish we have has soy sauce, mirin. I've used them all together. Um, because it, it does, it kind of provides you, and you have to obviously be careful not to make it too salty, but I think that's where the mirin comes in to back off that salt and to kind of cut that salt content. But, um, you know, for me, it's kind of all those play off each other to make a, a really great sauce. And I'm, certainly I'm not a uh, classic Japanese chef, so I hope nobody is and is like, what is he talking about? But, uh, <laughs> Oh, microphone, sorry. I don't, oh, sorry, maybe nobody else heard that question. I heard it, but I'll wait till you ask it. Yeah, you yeah. use the red miso paste. I don't know if you always use the red miso paste. Um, I don't. Actually, I was brought, for this demonstration, I was brought in a bunch of samples. And so for what I was doing, and, you know, I went through, I marinated some steak. And uh, the really, you know, and it's, the difference was, is the age um, for these particular ones that I was sent. So the really darker miso paste was aged longer. Um, and so I marinated some hanger steak in that, and, and uh, you know, I did different things with the different miso. I just felt like this for uh, the demonstration and just flavor-wise, I felt like this would shine through 
the best. But um, no, I think there's different applications for each one. Uh, you know, the prawns I marinated in a white miso, which came out really great, and I grilled them, and they were really delicious. Uh, so just particularly for this demonstration, the miso butter that I made, uh, I didn't think the white miso stood up to the butter. I, I think it kind of got lost. So I think it needed a little bit heavier miso, a little bit more flavor, robust miso to it, um, which is interesting. We were just talking about this earlier that, you know, the miso kind of uh, follows along that line of cheese and wine where, you know, the, the more it's aged, the more interesting and complex the flavors are. Uh, so, and I felt like this particular application kind of warranted a, a deeper flavor. White miso, yeah. Sure. Question back there. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about um, soy oil. It seems to have made its way into a lot of processed foods, as have vegetable oils. And I'm wondering what the difference is health-wise between eating soy and soy oils or vegetable oils. I'll leave that to you. I, I paired okay. miso with butter, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. So what I, what I generally say, uh, uh, partly from a personal perspective, but, but more generally, is that if, uh, soy oil isn't necessarily bad, but in terms of selecting uh, oils that one uses at home for cooking or whatever, uh, what I generally recommend are those that, uh, first, high-quality vegetable oils, and second, those that have been used traditionally in traditional cuisine. So that includes olive oil, includes sesame oil, and includes, in some contexts, peanut oil. And, and, uh, and so, so some of those are you know, sort of more traditionally used. Soy, soy oil hasn't been used as much traditionally, but it's certainly soybeans are a relatively high oil uh, bean. Uh, so you can crush them, and you know, the oil will come out. And so I think that that fits into the general scheme of things. Now, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, it depends on if you work for Monsanto or not. Um, <laughs> should, uh, you know, sort of take, take a, you know, sort of... I'm putting on my political hat, I guess, <laughs> or my biased hat. Uh, unfortunately, a large proportion of the soy beans and soy products come from genetically modified seeds that, of course, Monsanto developed and, you know, these are these Roundup-ready seeds and stuff. So... Whether that has long-term health effects, we really don't know. You know, those studies really haven't been done, and they can't be done unless you start labeling these products. Proposition 37, that's, that's another political context here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, so, you know, one might want to consider that as well. Uh, but you can get good quality, you know, organically uh, sourced soy oil, too. So, yeah, uh, there was a question just down the road. Uh -huh. This question is also for Dr. Kushi. Um, I heard that um, miso um, is a natural blood thinner and that you shouldn't drink miso when, if you're taking Coumadin or one of those types of um, medications. So my question was, have you heard that? And if so, are there other, um, is it something specific about miso or is it all fermented foods? I, I'm going to have to... Uh, say that I don't actually know. I've not heard that. Uh, I don't know if anyone in the audience has, or if, if you have. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know, no. Okay. <laughs> so, does, so if, if anyone does know, do you, no, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, let's take uh, one more question up there and then come back to the front. Uh -huh. Sorry, ap apologies for being totally ignorant on that topic. <laughs> Yes, I was wondering if you could tell us how to make miso. Hmm. Um, you know, I don't. I I know it's a fermentation process. I couldn't walk you through the exact steps, but uh, you know, it's it's a matter of fermenting the uh, soybeans uh, and the grains. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I've never made it. I mean, which is why we're here tonight is so we can buy the uh, beautiful buy the Yeah, yeah, exactly. Version of miso. So. So the somewhat less simplistic version of the process, basically, is that you do take uh, the soybeans and you do uh, cook them and then mash them you know, so that they really are you know, sort of a, uh, you know, basically much more of a uh, paste or you know, sort of whatever. It's, it's not really a paste at that point. Uh, the other key ingredient that I did not mention is koji. 
you know, which is really the source of the fermentation. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and you can mix it up with grains or not, which you would prepare the same way. And then you would basically mix it all together, and then you can lay it on, you know, put it in some sort of container, and then you let it ferment for, you know, some of the misos that you can purchase uh, uh, have been fermented for years, some of them, and some for only a matter of a few weeks. Uh, so, so the length of fermentation really does influence the, the flavor of the miso, you know, even if the ingredients are identical. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, what other grains you might mix it in with might differ. Uh, the, the chickpea miso, you know, getting back to that, or the azuki pea miso, you don't usually see those in Japan so much. Those are things that have been created in the U.S. Uh, sort of market. Um, I, I will say, you know, that a couple of the products that I showed, the South River miso and the miso master, those were created by uh, people who studied about sort of Japanese natural products of, you know, when they... And they went to Japan, uh, studied with traditional miso makers, and then came back here. And uh, South River, uh, which is more pricey, uh, is based in Western Massachusetts. Uh, miso Master is based in uh, the uh, Western North Carolina, but they're actually, you know, produced and you know everything, you know, uh, from scratch here. Uh, so those are, you know, sort of, in a sense, locally sourced versions. Um, of course, uh, you know, misos travel well, and so you know a lot of the miso you can get comes from Japan or elsewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so, question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think the miso is also contains uh, koji. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, is Japanese koji koji is special, different from the one? And another question is that when I was a child in Japan, the old miso was sold unrefrigerated. Mm -hmm. Now I, old miso are sold under refrigeration. Yeah. Right. So what happens? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so as I've just mentioned, yeah, koji is you know, a key ingredient. That's the source of the fermentation. It's a uh, uh, sort of uh, bacterially infested sort of rice grains and stuff. Uh, but um, uh, the... Uh, so, so I don't know whether the koji that's used, for example, by uh, the uh, miso master folks in North Carolina uh, are different from, say, you know, sort of uh, miso that's used, you know, in Japan. I, uh, I don't know if the quality is different or whatever. So, again, apologies. I don't know that one. And you're right, actually. Miso was, I, I recall that, too. In my childhood, you know, miso was not sold in the fridge in the refrigerated section. And actually, it would, when you purchased it, there would be kind of this, you know, sort of white skin sort of on the surface of the miso, you know, and then we just mix it back into the miso. <laughs> because it's a high salt food, it's naturally sort of preserved in a sense. Mm -hmm. So, and, um, and the fermentation process can continue to go on. As I mentioned, you know, you could have misos that's, ferment, that's been fermented for years. And so it's actually not necessarily a bad thing to not have it refrigerated. It change, it'll change the quality over time. Uh, and probably you won't necessarily want to keep it, you know, sort of you buy something and let it sit around for years before you use it. But, you know, but it probably isn't necessarily a bad thing in the, in the context of miso. Uh, so, uh, so, it, so it, you know, it's an interesting observation, which I hadn't really thought about uh, myself. Uh, yeah, uh, question? Yeah, so, so uh, okay, so the question was, uh, there's a lot of controversy about uh, whether women with breast cancer should be given, should be eating soy products because of the phytoestrogens. The isoflavones are really the phytoestrogens, which I alluded to. I, I guess two, two things first to clarify. The studies I showed were about breast cancer incidence or the development of breast cancer, not what you do once you have breast cancer. Uh, and it's 
the studies seem quite consistent that regular soy eaters have lower breast cancer rates than people who don't eat soy regularly. Now, as of now, I think there are four studies now of women with breast cancer that have been published looking at this question. So after you're diagnosed with breast cancer, I didn't show any of the results, but, uh, uh, but there are at least four studies now that are published on this topic. One conducted in California that uh, some colleagues of mine are, are involved in, uh, one in Shanghai you know, uh, um, that some other colleagues of mine are involved in, uh, uh, another one in, in Japan. Uh, and all of these actually show, including the US studies, uh, that women who consume regular soy products actually do not do worse than people who don't. The concern is really based on the idea that most breast cancers, about 70% of breast cancers, are estrogen receptor positive. Uh, so they're hormone receptor positive. And so the idea is that if they're exposed to high levels of uh, estrogen-like compounds, then it might uh, help the cells to proliferate, and therefore the, the cancer will spread or metastasize or whatever. So that's considered to be not a good thing. And so one of the treatments that's given for those is hormone therapy you know, to ba basically block that. That's why you, you know, people are given tamoxifen or something like that. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but the... But all of this concern is actually a theoretical concern. Sure, you, you played out you know, breast cancer cells that are estrogen receptor positive in a Petri dish, and you give them isoflavones, and they'll proliferate. Okay? That's been demonstrated, you know, clearly. But what hasn't really been shown until recently, and, these are, and there are these few studies now, uh, they both basically all demonstrate that actually some regular soy consumption probably is, if anything, beneficial. Uh, and so. Um, so I think that that concern really is from, uh, from a theoretical basis rather than actually observing what happens in humans. So, uh, and actually, the American Cancer Society, I should say, of course, I chaired the committee, so maybe there was a little bit of <laughs> bias, but, but the American Cancer Society, in their prevention guidelines, while we don't explicitly say, you know, eat soy, we do point to that controversy and say, you know, from what we can see now, there really doesn't seem to be a real basis for concern based on these human studies. Uh, yes, question here. Mm -hmm. Microphone? Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I've been enjoying very much uh, the presentation. And uh, then I take the liberty to uh, ask you a question outside the MISO. OK. <laughs> you, you show uh, the um, Asian food pyramid. Mm -hmm. which are the bottom are grains and rice. Mm -hmm. And I love white rice, I really like that. And I, when I travel in Japan, most, most of the rice I love is, is, uh, is the, eating is the white rice mm -hmm. as, as much as in Japanese restaurants. Yeah. Is that supposed to be a daily, uh, if that's supposed to be a daily food, uh, is, is there any bad thing about it? Or, uh, what is the, uh, yeah. in your opinion, white rice uh, versus, versus uh, whole rice? Yeah. So, uh, you might have noticed, I didn't actually highlight this, uh, but in our eight traditional Asian diet pyramid, we actually say whole grains uh, as opposed to white rice. And you're absolutely right. You travel to Japan or go to you know, many Japanese restaurants, and the default will be white rice, except in like, the San Francisco Bay Area. You know, then they'll give you brown rice, too. <laughs> you know? But almost everywhere else, they'll give you white rice. <laughs> so, uh, and um, it's clear that whole grain if you're going to be consuming cereal products, that whole, whole grain-based cereal products are better than refined grain products. It doesn't matter if it's rice or wheat or you know, whatever. Uh, and there's no question. And probably uh, the high white rice consumption in particular might actually be contributing to uh, sort of elevated diabetes rates and um, uh, perhaps contributing to those colon cancer dramatic changes as well. Uh, among other things. Uh, so uh, if people in Japan were really consuming more brown rice, as I actually like the French term, re complet better, you know, complete rice than brown rice. It sounds like, you know, just the color. Maybe it's dirty or something. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, it's pretty clear that, uh, you know, I'm, some colleagues of mine at Harvard are actually doing these studies in, in China now to see if substitution of brown rice for white rice might actually uh, result in uh, better sort of metabolic parameters. Uh, so anyway, 
brown rice preferred in general. But oftentimes restaurants don't know how to prepare it, so. <laughs> so. Yes, question. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I would just say that, you know, as, as a questioner asked, uh, um, both my mother and my sister did pass away from cancer. That's what she indicated. Um, uh, and they were, uh, I can't remember if they were ever hospitalized for a long period or not. But in any case, they, most of their treatments were at Mass General, which is in Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, but, uh, but they were largely you know, at home for most of the time. And, uh, and, they, and yes, we traditionally eat miso and other soy products. So, so I know that they did consume that you know, at home. So, uh, but anyway, uh, you had a question for? Uh, I, I was surprised that you use a very uh, a major basic Japanese ingredients in the miso and the dough and the uh, sake and other things too. And which one did you start to use first? The miso, and I wonder why you start using miso. You know, I think um, you know when I was at Boule, Boule. Uh, had a very he had an affinity for Japanese cuisine, um, and I think that uh, maybe my first exposure to Japanese cuisine um, was through Boule. And I think you know he opened a, a restaurant actually dedicated to I believe Kaisaki. Is that my saying that right? Kaisaki, Kaisaki yeah. type of cuisine. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know I, I think probably. You know, I, I, it's hard for me to pinpoint where things come into play in my career and why I do th- things the way I do. I, you know, some it's part of the experience that I've had, and and so uh, somehow I've just always put it in my back pocket and kept it with me, and uh, so it's something that I've kind of always used through the years. And uh, it's hard to say exactly what, to pinpoint where where I first started using it, but uh, certainly mm-hmm. it's that exposure that I had to it originally. Um, my question is directed to Dr. Kushi. Um, so uh, last year or so, uh, there was a, an article, uh, a study published um, that showed that the, uh, some Japanese people uh, have a uh, higher frequency to harbor a certain gut microbia mm-hmm. that basically uh, allowed them to uh, extract more nutrients from uh, things like seaweed, um, for instance. Um, and... So I was wondering, because you showed you showed a lot of studies, especially like the one in Iowa. That's uh, obviously the it wasn't statistically significant because uh, you didn't have a high enough population size. Um, but you know, it's one thing to say that oh, we can study things in Japan and um, we see that those show uh, statistically significant things. Mm-hmm. But it is another thing to say oh, that can be expanded to the mm-hmm. United States, mm-hmm. where perhaps uh, Western populations can't uh, extract the same sort of nutrients or the same amount of nutrients out of the mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. out of miso and out of mm-hmm. soy products. So I was wondering mm-hmm. if there's anything that's been looked mm-hmm. at that shows um, a difference in uh, the a difference in the nutrients that uh, one can extract mm-hmm. between Western and Eastern populations. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if you have any uh, things yeah. about okay. this. Okay. Just before I answer, I will mention that uh, there is reception, so if that will be happening in you know, as soon as we break here. Uh, so if anyone else, of course, the people who just left didn't hear that, but uh, so maybe they'll miss it. But, uh, uh, but if anyone else wants to leave, you know, you can feel free to, you know, lounge up there and have some tastings and stuff. Uh, so uh, I want to welcome everybody to that. Uh, but anyway, getting back to your question, uh, you're absolutely right that gut, mic- gut bacteria, basically, uh, the sort of the microbiota, as, as uh, you know, it's an area that's actually become of a lot more interest in recent years. Uh, the National Institutes of Health has you know, sort of created, a, they're trying to stimulate funding in this area. Uh, and people seem to have different sort of types of bacteria that sort of you know, reside, re, reside there naturally. And the only way you can really mess it up is if you give somebody antibiotics. You know, but then even after that, they seem to colonize again. Uh, one example, specifically in the soy context, is uh, about half of us are what are known as equal producers. Uh, we basically metabolize some of these isoflavones in a certain way that the other half of us cannot. And so when you look at 
uh, when you analyze our urine, you know, some of us has e have equal and some of us don't. You know, and that reflects differences. And, and that's specifically due to the type of bacteria that we actually have in our, in our gut in terms of how it gets metabolized and then what gets absorbed. Uh, so, so you're absolutely right that there are these potential differences. And so whether something that occurs you know, in the natural environment in Japan or in China or whatever and the population that's lived there for a long time, you know, does that translate directly? We don't really know. But we do know from uh, many observations that when people move, they take on the disease characteristics of the place they, they're living, not where they're from. Okay? And so it doesn't matter if it's Japanese moving here or you know, long-term generation people from here moving to Japan or something like that. Uh, we see that. And, and part of that you know, goes along with adoption of you know, different you know, sort of uh, habits, you know, food choices, and other things like that. So we do know that people can change, and disease rates change, and it follows that. You know, so, so broadly speaking, I would say, yeah, you know, these findings probably do apply. And we did have seen you know, that you know, even though you can see them more in Asia and different parts of Asia, uh, because people here in the US don't eat much soy, uh, uh, at least in a measurable sort of way, I'd say that broadly speaking, they probably do apply. Um, yeah. OK, I think so Owen, take it away. I would like to <laughs> question you're all thinking is when and what are we going to eat? So <laughs> when is very soon. And, but before I tell you what, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Cushy and Chef uh, Blanco for their excellent demonstration and presentation. <laughs>